This is the fifth video in this series on how to interpret a chest x-ray and the topic is the cardiac silhouette and mediastinum. Learning objectives are to be able to assess those structures on x-ray and to know the common etiologies of abnormalities seen in them. Let's take a look at the anatomy of the cardiac silhouette and mediastinum that was first introduced in lesson two. For this lesson, it will be important to remember the structures listed here which comprise the different segments of that silhouette. This video will be divided in half. The first half will cover abnormalities of the heart. The second will cover abnormalities of the hyla and the remainder of the mediastinum. Before I discuss specific findings, I need to also review another very important difference between PA and AP films that I haven't talked about yet. Let's start with a PA film and here is an axial cross-section through the thorax at the level of the heart. The patient's front is up against the photographic plate at the top. In some of the prior videos, I've sort of implied that the x-ray beams which are responsible for creating the x-ray image are all parallel to one another. But this isn't actually true. The x-ray source is a fixed point, or close to a fixed point, and therefore the x-ray beams actually diverge outward as they get further from their origin. For a PA film, this makes not much difference. Since the heart is a relatively anterior structure in the chest, it is close to the film where the x-ray is taken, and therefore the shadow it casts on the x-ray is an accurate representation of its true size. However, how does this change if the same exact patient has an AP film taken? Now there is greater separation between the heart and the film. As a consequence, the diverging x-ray beams will create a larger shadow that will exaggerate the size of the heart. In short, the heart size is only accurate when assessed on a PA film. Some structures within the mediastinum suffer from the same effect, but to lesser extent, as normal mediastinal structures tend to be more centrally located within the thorax. To see just how much of a difference this can make, here are two x-rays, taken of the same patient, minutes apart. Notice how much larger the heart appears on the AP film. The upper mediastinum is also affected, but not as much. I'll now talk about some specific abnormalities of the cardiac silhouette. The most common abnormal finding is cardiomegaly. Cardiomegaly simply means that the overall size of the heart is larger than normal. There are a couple of ways it can be defined in radiology, but by far the most common way to define it for analysis of chest x-rays uses the cardiothoracic ratio. This ratio is the maximum horizontal cardiac width divided by the maximum horizontal thoracic width as measured between the inner surfaces of the rib cage. Cardiomegaly is said to be present if this ratio exceeds 50% on a PA film. Here are two x-rays. Looking at the one on the left first, the red line represents the maximum horizontal cardiac width and the purple line represents the maximal horizontal thoracic width. This is a ratio of 40% or 0.4, which is normal. Looking at the same on the right film, the heart is obviously much larger. This is a ratio of 60% or 0.6. Identifying cardiomegaly on x-ray is really that simple. As far as the etiologies of cardiomegaly, it can essentially be the consequence of any cause of left or right-sided heart failure. It's important to re realize that pericardial effusions, which I'll discuss in a minute, can be indistinguishable from the cardiomegaly that's a consequence of an enlarged heart. While the finding of cardiomegaly concerns the heart as a whole, there are two cardiac chambers that can be identified as being enlarged on x-ray individually. The first is the left atrium. As discussed in the last lesson, one finding of left atrial enlargement is splaying of the carinal angle to a value greater than 90 degrees. The second finding is something called the double density sign. Usually, the right border of the left atrium is not visible on x-ray because it is contiguous with the right atrium and it lies right in the middle of the chest where it usually gets obscured by a number of other structures.
However, as the left atrium increases in size, it actually will stretch well across the midline and create a second shadow along the right heart border. This dark red line here is the right atrium. The pink line here is the left atrium. Etiologies of left atrial enlargement include any cause of left-sided heart failure. Also included is mitral valve disease, such as mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, or mitral valve prolapse. For this particular x-ray, there is a clue as to why this patient has a large left atrium. While the overall size of the heart is enlarged, suggesting uh, the presence of heart failure, assuming this is a PA film, there's another important finding. It is this round structure right here. What is that? It's the ring of a mitral valve replacement. So this patient has had some form of mitral valve disease that at least contributed to the enlarged left atria. The second cardiac chamber, whose enlargement can sometimes be individually spotted on x-ray, is the right ventricle. The main finding of this is filling of the retrosternal space as seen on the lateral view. Consider these two lateral films. I've included a normal one for comparison. And examine the retrosternal space, that is the one or two centimeters directly behind the sternum in the mid-chest region. In the normal film, this will be relatively lucent. However, as the right ventricle is the most anterior of the cardiac chambers, as it enlarges, it begins to occupy this space. Etiologies of right ventricular enlargement include any cause of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary valve disease the second of which is much less common in the adult population. Moving on to pericardial effusions, not all clinically relevant effusions are visible on x-ray, particularly if they developed acutely. That's because pericardial tamponade, a condition where diastolic cardiac filling is impaired due to high intrapericardial pressure, is dependent on both the volume of fluid within the pericardium as well as the speed with which the fluid accumulated. The primary finding of an effusion is an enlarged cardiac silhouette. Other findings include what is frequently called the water bottle morphology of the silhouette, as well as something called the Oreo cookie sign. Here are two examples of the water bottle shape of a very large pericardial effusion. You may be wondering how in the world these look like water bottles, but the name was given when water bottles weren't made out of aluminum or rigid plastic, but rather soft-sided materials like leather. Next, the Oreo cookie sign is a little amusing. It's seen on the lateral film. I'm going to zoom in on this part right here. To understand what you're looking at, you'll need to know what an Oreo cookie looks like. I'm sure there are parts of the world that are not familiar with this fantastic, mass-produced, artificially flavored treat. So here's a picture. The important aspect is that it consists of a layer of white cream sandwiched between two dark, supposedly chocolate-flavored discs. If you look really carefully, you can actually see the same configuration in front of the heart, just above the diaphragm. It's not normal to have three layers discernible here, so what's responsible for each? The posterior chocolate layer, which is relatively radiolucent, is the pericardial fat. The middle cream layer, which is relatively radiodense, is a pericardial effusion. And the anterior chocolate layer is the epicardial fat. This sign exists because fluid absorbs ever so slightly more x-rays than fat does. There are many etiologies of pericardial effusions, which can be divided into those which cause acute effusions and those which cause subacute to chronic effusions. Acute effusions can be from trauma, viral pericarditis, a complication from myocardial infarction, such as a catastrophic free wall rupture or a post MI inflammatory process called Dresler syndrome or it can be iatrogenic from a right ventricular biopsy or from any one of a number of EP procedures. Subacute and chronic effusions are seen in malignancy such as lymphoma, breast, and lung, but can also be due to renal failure, collagen vascular disease like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, hypothyroidism, and finally tuberculosis, which is the major cause of pericardial effusions in some parts of the world. Before moving on to the mediastinum and hyla, I want to briefly mention a congenital anomaly, uh, which, although it's relatively rare, tends to be mentioned during rounds or on tests out of proportion to its prevalence. At first, you might assume this x-ray was loaded into the system backwards 
if it wasn't for the capital R in the upper corner indicating that in fact the x-ray is in the correct orientation. This person has dextrocardia, which occurs when the heart loops around in the opposite direction as normal during early embryologic development. Its incidence is about 1 in 12,000 pregnancies. It may be isolated and discovered incidentally, or it can be associated with life-threatening additional congenital malformations. Now we'll move on to abnormalities of the mediastinum and hyla. The most important of these abnormalities is a widened mediastinum. This is generally defined as greater than 8 centimeters on either a PA or an AP film. However, most cases of an apparently widened mediastinum are due to rotation of the patient, poor inspiratory effort, or an AP view. To best understand mediastinal masses, which are responsible for truly widened mediastinums, one must be familiar with the four regions of the mediastinum. These regions are not precisely defined by any actual tissue planes, and their definition varies slightly between sources, but this is approximately where the divisions lie. The first two regions are the anterior mediastinum, which is everything anterior to the pericardium and inferior to the sternal angle, and superior mediastinum, which is everything superior to the sternal angle. The differential diagnosis of masses in these two regions overlap greatly, so I'll consider them together. They include lymphoma, enlarged thyroid, such as a goiter, thymus tumors, tumors called teratomas, and when occurring in just the superior mediastinum, an aortic aneurysm. The middle mediastinum includes everything within the pericardium and is variably defined to also include the subcarinal, paratracheal, and hilar lymph nodes and the esophagus. The differential diagnosis of masses here include lymphadenopathy from any cause, an aortic aneurysm, pericardial cyst, dilated esophagus, or a hiatal hernia. Finally, the posterior mediastinum includes everything behind those structures, which ends up being largely just a perivertebral space. Thus, the differential diagnosis of masses located here include neurogenic tumors and extension of spinal masses such as tumors and infections. I'll show you one or two examples from each region. Beginning in the superior mediastinum, we see that there is a mass here that is actually causing rightward shift of the trachea. Although you could not know it just from this x-ray, this particular patient has a multinodular goiter. This patient has an even larger mass in the superior mediastinum. This one is from lymphoma. Anterior mediastinal masses can easily be missed especially on PA films, since their shadow can get lost in the cardiac silhouette. This is a pretty unusual case in which an anterior mass was not only visible, it was so large it resembled the water bottle morphology of a large pericardial effusion. The hint to the correct diagnosis is from the lateral film. What do you notice here? There is an obliteration of the retrosternal space. While this could be from concurrent right ventricular hypertrophy, as we saw a few minutes ago. In this case, it's from a massive thymolipoma that is literally wrapped around the anterior surface of the heart. Here we see an unusual bump coming off the left upper heart border. Even if I didn't tell you that this was a middle mediastinal mass, you could still tell that from the lack of a clear boundary between a normal cardiac silhouette and the mass. Here's a corresponding lateral film to confirm its placement in the middle mediastinum. Its appearance is consistent with a pericardial cyst, which could be confirmed with a chest CT or echocardiogram. Finally, here is a posterior mass. You can tell it's not middle from the PA film because there is still a very well-defined left heart border. The lateral film confirms this mass is arising from the posterior mediastinum. In this case, biopsy demonstrated a schwannoma. Here's an interesting collection of mediastinal masses, which are critical to accurately identify. These are all aortic aneurysms. The one in the middle is particularly easy to identify given the calcified walls, since only vascular structures or cysts tend to do that. I'll move on from the mediastinum to talk about the hyla. Here are two examples of bilateral hyla enlargement. In this case, both patients had stage 1 sarcoidosis.
The differential diagnosis of Heidler enlargement is very long and can be divided into three categories. First, malignancy, which includes primary lung cancer, lymphoma, and metastatic disease. The second category is infection, particularly tuberculosis and viruses, but a whole host of rare diseases are included here as well. Depending on where in the world you are practicing and watching this video, there may be many more diseases on your list than listed here. Finally, in the other category are sarcoidosis, silicosis, pulmonary hypertension, a pulmonary artery aneurysm, and a bronchogenic cyst. Here's another example of Heidler enlargement. In this case, the patient had severe pulmonary hypertension. In this case, there is unilateral right-sided enlargement. Unfortunately, it's associated with this opacity in the right upper lung that looks suspicious for a primary tumor. Overall, the most likely diagnosis here is a primary lung cancer with a Heidler node metastasis. I'll end this lesson by talking about how one can use the hilum overlay sign to distinguish a hilar mass from one anterior or posterior to it. Consider this film, which has an obvious mass of some kind in the vicinity of the left hilum. When a mass arises from the hilum, the adjacent pulmonary vessels will become obscured. If the pulmonary vessels are still visible through the mass, the mass is not in the hilum. If we zoom in on the mass like this, you can still see the outline of the left pulmonary artery. And if we check the lateral film, we see that indeed the mass is posterior to the hilum. To diagnose the cause of the mass, look here. There is a very thin rim of peripheral calcification. That means either a vascular structure or a cyst. In this case, it was a saccular aortic aneurysm. That concludes this video on the cardiac silhouette and mediastinum. The next video will cover assessment of the diaphragm and pleura.